All right, so good afternoon. Good afternoon. Try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, so I am still Staff Sergeant Wright. Uh, today we are going to be having today we're going to be having a block of instruction on human performance optimization and injury prevention. I know that sounds like a lot of words. I will be explaining what that is. This is your second block of instruction on special conditioning programs and reconditioning. All right, so before we get into this, a few safety considerations. I know a lot of you do have your bags. Some of you have laptops out, so there's cords in different locations. Uh, you do have things on the ground. So if we do get up and we move or you need to relocate to the latrines at any point in time during this block of instruction, please be cognizant of your surroundings. We don't want anyone tripping over anything. We do have three exits in the room. We have one to my left, one directly behind me to my right, and one behind you. In case of emergency where we need to vacate the building, we're gonna exit toward we're going to exit out the door behind you and, and relocate in the parking lot across the street. Right. So for this class, again, human performance, human performance optimization and injury prevention, what this class was originally intended for, or what it was originally built for, was a briefing for the First Sergeant Commander's course. So when the Master Fitness Trainer Program came back in 2012, as we've discussed in previous classes, there were a lot of units that were not doing physical readiness training and they were not adequately set up for, ready, for increasing the readiness of their unit. The, and of course, the MFT program just came back. They didn't have those trainers. This is what you are here for now. But the course has evolved a lot since 2012, even since 2014. It's evolved in the last year or so, and we've made modifications to the class accordingly. What we're gonna be covering in this class are, are why some changes have happened from the way we used to do physical training to the physical readiness training that we do now and other things you need to be aware of as a trainer with regards to safety considerations, injuries, and things of that nature. We're gonna get a little bit further into injuries also. So you remember that yesterday we did a film of you, just a very quick film of your gait analysis. We're going to be using that footage on Monday next week. We're gonna be going into running technique and analysis so you can actually see all of the little biomechanical movements that go along with your running. And we'll talk about the, how to make that more or less efficient. But as a trail into that, because running is a big aspect of what we do in the Army, um, I just want to briefly touch on something to get into it. So to, to drive this point home of what I'm going to show you on screen, the first thing I need you to do is go ahead and stand up. You can go ahead and tuck in your chairs. And all I want you to do is just jog in place. I want you to get a feeling of what's hitting the ground, how your foot's touching the ground, the feeling that's coming into your body, the sound of it. What's hitting the ground right now? Ball the ball of your foot, right? Is that different for anyone? Or is the ball of foot for practically everybody? Does anyone feel like they have trouble staying still? Anyone feel like they're having trouble going forward or backward? Or they're forcing themselves to go forward or backward? No? What I'm getting ready to show you as far as a, a video getting into this, you're gonna look at a foot strike analysis video. We're gonna look at a heel strike and we're looking at a four foot strike. First, with running flats on, then we're gonna look at it barefoot so you can see the difference. At the very bottom of the video, you're gonna see a pressure graph, just the easiest way to explain it. So what you're seeing on my right, your left, is someone with racing flats landing on a treadmill using their forefoot. Now, when you're running without an external applicator on your foot, you can see there is a slight amount of raise, but overall it's still quite gradual with landing on the ball of the foot. So when you hear of a lot of things such as uh, tibial fractures or shin splints, right, or you have a lot of patella fr fractures, patella issues, any type of knee issues or hip issues, a lot of that due to, it can be due to several things, but landing on that heel continuously causes those bones to have to adapt, causes the muscles to have to adjust to those bones over and over for every stride that you have, every step that you have, and then of course an injury can come along with that. Now was PRT designed for the APFT? No, it was not, right? So physical readiness training was, was that reverse engineering from the warrior task and battle drills. It's designed to give you better body mechanics as a tactical athlete so that you don't have to consciously worry about or think about your contractions on how far your feet are apart and yet every single joint angle you focus on getting that neurological repetition of every single one of those movements so that when you need to react, 
you're not going to be a liability to yourself or someone else. Right? You're not going to be at that high risk of injury. You're going to be at that optimal level of performance. Agility is, is paramount. You have to be able to stop, start, and change direction, which is why we have it so much in physical readiness training. Right? So uh, what the directive was put out is that although the APFT is our current standard that you do once a year, it's an assessment to basically make sure that your soldiers are maintaining a general level of physical training. But it is not an assessment to say they are a good athlete. In fact, a lot of the research has shown that those that score 300 are not necessarily the best well-rounded athlete. A lot of times you'll have individuals that are scoring between a 260 and a 280 being the best overall athletes once everything is assessed, strength, power, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people that did score 300 actually scored lower overall because they were focused so much on either one single phase or one single plane of motion. How many of you in reserve units where you have your failures taken an APFT every month? How efficient do you think that is? No. So how, how do you think your soldiers feel? When, you take, when they take an APFT every month after they've been failing. And I'll get right back to you, Sergeant. It's a very good point, right? It's not helping you get to where you need to be. If you're failing something and I just have you do it again, I'm not really giving you an educational experience. Now, on the motivational aspect, where maybe, you're, maybe your unit's using it as a measure, right, to make sure they're just doing what they need to do, their due diligence on their own time, which they need to be doing, right? Say you were just not at that score and we said, nope, you failed. Come back and take it next month. And just every month you start failing, and that's counting against you. Now you can't go to schools, now you can't get promoted. What would you want us to do instead if you failed? What would be the next thing you'd expect from us as instructors or your leader? <laughs> to help you. How can you get better? Right? So you're here being educated and, and certified as trainers to go back and teach your soldiers. Instead of just going and telling them they're failing all the time and maybe lowering their overall uh, motivation, well, you can spend that amount of time and educate them properly. Right? So using our special conditioning programs to take your APFT failures, your body composition failures, and educate them on how they can get better. How many of you were ever taught in the Army how to run? But it's expected of you for your career. Right? So that's a disservice. Not that your leaders didn't, well, your leaders may not have known. Right? I know I certainly didn't know. No one came and taught me how to run prior to the Master Fitness Training course either which is why we have that in a block of instruction. So it's very important that you're here so you can address those issues. Good, so what are the type of injuries that you saw in basic training all the time? So we have what? Their feet for one and? And their hips, right? So more specifically, a femoral neck stress injury, a femoral neck stress fracture, right? Does everyone, so quick on the anatomy aspect, your femur being that largest bone in your body, what's happening right here as opposed to the other side? Yeah, their femur is cracked right around the femoral neck. It's completely fractured, right? This was happening to a large, a large majority of the individuals that were going through basic training. And this isn't something where drill sergeants were doing uh, their soldiers wrong and ignoring the pain and having them push through. This type of injury was a slight fracture that you would not feel, that would just keep growing and growing and growing, and you would feel it when that happened. And at that point, it's too late. The Army wanted to do something about it. So for those of you who remember 21-20, we used to run a lot. Every day is run day, right? We're doing running every day. So along with the studies, what they found, they tested duration and they tested frequency. And duration, what you're looking at, the big part to put your eyes to, is the difference between 30 and 45 minutes, right? You'll notice in physical readiness training in your endurance chapter, in chapter 10, 7-22, chapter 10, we are not allowed to, or we will not run more than 30 minutes for our primary activity. It will not happen. So you know where that came from. They saw that running on a difference from 30 to 45 minutes as a group. Now this is not based on the individual, right? Your own individual level of performance is completely different than testing an entire force that we must get ready as a standard. So an individual difference and a group difference are, there's a distinction between the two. But running between 30 and 40 minutes, you'll see that there's a 125% increase in their incident of injury, their risk of injury, but they only got 5% change or increase in cardiovascular, and they're only about 18 seconds faster on the two mile. Right, so it's that cost uh, versus uh, benefit reward, that risk versus benefit reward that we've been talking about. You want to optimize training, but reduce injury. So they tested on the duration. Now, what's the maximum number of times we can run a week now? A little bit louder. You, you had it right the first one, John. So three, so we only run three times a week now. And that's because they found that increasing from three to five times a week to which we used to run, 
it will make it will increase your cardiovascular uh, capacity 35%, which is phenomenal. I'm sure all of you would like 36 seconds off of your two-mile run as well. But do you think that's worth the risk of increasing your injury rate by 225%, right? So where do you think most of these injuries were happening outside of running? Whether someone was deployed or not, where do you think most of our musculoskeletal injuries were occurring? In jumping, yes, but someone said it. Sports. Right, what does AR, does anyone know what AR350-1 says about sports, conducting sports? It is not recommended to conduct sports for your unit. And another problem we used to see, uh, still see it from time to time with PRT, people would see that PRT is mandatory, and what they would do is what we call the PRT sandwich. They would conduct preparation drills or warm-up, whatever activity they would want, flag football or something along those lines, and then recovery drill for their cool down, saying they met the standards. How many of you have did that at your unit or experienced that? Right, so it's something that happens, right? It's obviously out there and it's occurring. That violates F7-22, right? When you conduct a physical readiness training session, you must do everything within the confines of physical readiness training. And you've already seen that if you do it right, does it work? Yes. Absolutely, and you still haven't even done your full session yet, right? That's gonna be next week. So it does work if everything is done right. What's the difference between, does anyone wanna take a guess at the difference between overload or overtraining? What do you think overload? You think it's good or bad? We'll start there. Bad. Why do you think it's bad? <laughs> it was just the 50-50? <laughs> All right, fair enough. So overload is actually not a bad thing. That's what you want. You want progressive overload on your system in order to have progress. If you can't do 10 push-ups and then you practice and practice and practice and you can do 10 push-ups and it becomes easy for you, but you never do more than 10 push-ups, you're not getting any better necessarily at your push-ups, right? In that regard, as far as that analogy. Is everyone tracking? I'm going with that? So overload, you need progressive, safe, regimented progressive overload in order to have progress. Overtraining, just as Lieutenant Green said, it is what you don't want. Now, if you start working too hard, you kill yourself at the gym, you feel like you need to barely be a go upstairs after a leg day, right? When you encounter all of these things, what happens is your body actually goes through something called overreaching first. Overreaching means that you're not giving yourself the adequate amount of rest and recovery or nutrition, and you're pushing your neurological system so hard and your musculoskeletal system so hard that it can't adapt. It doesn't have time to adapt. Now, when you do that over time, does anyone know what homeostasis means? Someone else that hasn't said anything. Want to take a guess? Yeah, homeostasis. Good. Your body's internal balance, right? It, it's ability to regulate pH, temperature, and everything else. So if you see the center line on the Bravo columns, the center line is your level of homeostasis. If you have an individual that works out every now and then, but stops for like a month or two, and then works out again, right? So those are those peaks where you're not really getting better or worse, you're just kind of there. If you allow progressive overload, right, you introduce the proper training, proper rest, proper recovery, you see your level of homeostasis starts to go up. That's your progress, that's you getting stronger, bigger, better, faster. If you, in, if you work out too hard, you do those high intensity interval trainings too much without little rest, high volume and high intensity, which we've already talked about, if your intensity goes up, you need to do what with your volume? You need to lower it. So if you have high intensity and uh, high volume, your level of homeostasis eventually drops. What do you think is gonna happen once it gets to a very low level? An injury, right? And we'll be discussing this a little bit further, but injuries are something that happens over time. They're not, they're chronic. They're not, unless you get shot, something's thrown at you or something impacts you immediately, if you feel that you bent down and pick up something and something hurts in your back, that incident did not cause that injury. It has been your posture both statically and dynamically over time that led to that injury. All right, so we're gonna touch on what injuries actually are and then we'll start to bring this class to a close. So we talked about earlier, are injuries, do most injuries happen at that point in time? No, so unless you have some type of impact or trauma, usually it's that straw that broke the camel's back theory, right? You've been doing something over and over and over again and then eventually something fails, right? So how many of you work out whether you run or go to the gym? Pretty much everyone in here, right? Because you're here at the Match Fitness Training Course. What do you think is more important? The one to two hours you go to the gym and two hours is a lot of time, or the other 22 hours a day? Right, how many of you sleep at least six hours a night? What do you think your body's gonna to defer to posturally? The two hours that you may spend in the gym, and again, that's a lot of time, or the six hours you're in one static position all night? The static position you're in all night, right? So how many of you have ever focused on your sleep posture overall? 
So we got three hands, approximately. How many of you have ever taught sleep posture? Right. It's so I mean, those is like, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> so sleep posture is very important. That static posture in all night is affecting your muscle, your, your length tension relationship all over your muscles. You're giving your body information. You're telling your body, I want my hip flexors to be short, right? Because I keep them there all day long. I, I'm there the whole night when I sleep. Then I get up, I go to the restroom, I'm on the toilet, hips are flexed, right? I sit down when I'm eating. I sit down at, when I'm driving to work. I sit down at work. So flexion, 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 flexion. So if my hips are flexed, that means I'm turning off my hip extenders, right? My hip extensors, which are what muscle? Your glutes, right? So your glutes extend your hips, which is what we, we there's a term in the exercise science community going on about glute amnesia, right? Your glutes are what keep you bipedal in the first place. This is what helps you sprint, run, jump, squat, and all that kind of stuff. Well, we keep our hips flexed so much that reciprocal inhibition that we've been talking about, if this is on, this has to be off. And if you do that all day long, you're giving your body that information. I want this on, I want this off, right? We already had the captain getting up like, all right, I'm done sitting down. <laughs> but this happens through everything else in your body, right? So you need to just be aware of that because if you don't fix your static posture throughout the day, it, it, you're, it's not that your gym time is, is, is negligible, it's still helping you. But if you figure out why am I getting injured if I'm working out properly, I'm fixing everything. Are you really fixing everything? How are you sitting on the couch? When you're driving, are you leaning on one side more than the other? How many of you stand on one foot more than another one? Right? And this is going to become evident when we talk about running analysis. You'll have one leg come straight forward, and you'll see your other one swing out. And then, when I sh then you do that while you walk. And now that you're aware of it, you're going to start watching it as you walk. But a lot of you, and you'll watch your soldiers. You'll watch people walk, cant it out, or they'll step with one leg forward and the other come out. And they're wondering why they're injured, because they're, they're eating right, they're doing everything right. Are they doing everything right? What did you go over this morning? What was the first thing you did this morning? Good, modifications and alternate, alternating exercises because you want your soldiers to maintain in the middle formation. We talked about doing a PT test every month, right? You don't want a, an injury usually becomes, and we've all been injured, right? Everyone in here has been injured in one shape or form. It, to an extent, it becomes your identity. And when you're a soldier that is already underperforming, Sometimes that becomes an individual's psychological crutch, right? I can't do this because I'm injured. I can't go do this. I can't do this. It becomes who they are. For us at the higher level of physical fitness, we typically see an, a, an injury as a career injury. Like, I, don't have, I can't afford it. I don't have the time to. I have to leave these people. I have something going on. I have to do this stuff. But, and it's unfortunate. So we have all these negative mindsets on an injury, but injuries happen. We have to be able to take that. You're still going to train. Bless you. You still have to train. You still have to move in order to heal. But now let's do it in an efficient manner so you can get better and it won't happen again.